Amen. Well, it's good to be with you all tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to do things a little bit differently than a normal uh, worship service on a Sunday morning that we would have, and even a little differently than our normal uh, baptism service. We're going to try something out tonight, so you guys are the guinea pigs. Um, but uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to give uh, just a short kind of uh, message, a short sermon uh, first on what it means to be baptized, what these folks are doing here in front of you, and um, what this is all about. And then we're going to have our, uh, we're going to have three baptisms tonight. And after those, we're going to actually, I'm going to come back up and we're going to uh, hear just a clear, simple, and short uh, presentation of the gospel. And so uh, you can think of this first uh, half, this first um, part of the sermon as a proclamation of what we're doing here. And then the second will be more of a, almost an invitation for you to, to know and uh, come to Christ if you don't know him already. Uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, if you could turn there with me to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. We're going to be looking at just two verses tonight. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. These are the words of Jesus himself. He says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But... Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Tonight is a blessed night. And as a church, we are gathering here in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gave the church the clear command in Scripture, to observe two ordinances or two rites, two, you could call them ceremonies, as the church. One is the Lord's Supper, also called communion. The other is called baptism. That's what we're doing tonight. We're going to be observing the second ordinance, the second rite, the second ceremony that Christ has commanded His church to observe, and that is the rite of baptism. Now, baptism is a picture of what has already happened in the soul uh, of those who you will hear from tonight. So nothing is being accomplished tonight as far as salvation. People that will be in these baptism waters tonight will, are not any more saved, uh, will not be any more saved than they are right now. Nothing spiritually, nothing as far as their salvation uh, is being accomplished here. Because as we even heard this morning, salvation is a product of grace and grace alone. So even if, if baptism were to accomplish something for our salvation, then there's no more grace, you see. But nonetheless, uh, it is a picture of what has already happened to the people that you're going to hear from tonight. The three gentlemen that you're going to hear from tonight have already repented of their sin, and placed their faith in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. And by that faith and that faith alone, they have been united to Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and then raised three days later, that accomplished our salvation. Because there on the cross, he died in our place. He suffered and absorbed, took in the wrath of God towards our sin for us in our place as our substitute. And then as he died there on the cross, he was taken off the cross and buried in a tomb. And just recently, 
If, if, if you were paying attention, we just had Easter. We just had Res- Resurrection Sunday, right? And uh, that was the remembrance that Christ didn't stay in the grave, but he rose again from the dead three days later. That's a historical fact. Those are historical events. And at that time, Christ accomplished the salvation of his people. That historical event is brought into our day and age whenever somebody places their trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. That accomplished work 2,000 years ago is applied to the sinner today. And that's what has happened in those that you will hear from tonight. And what you're going to see is a picture of that day, of that night or that morning, whenever that was for them, what you're going to see is a picture of what happened spiritually to them on that day when they placed their faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What happened when they placed their faith in Jesus? Their old self died. They rejected and turned from that old life of sinful rebellion because they had found a greater treasure, a better life. They had found true life in Jesus Christ alone. And when they placed their faith in Christ, that old self died. And, what, and that is symbolized by them being dunked into the water, dying and being buried with Christ in the tomb. And then them coming out, the fact that I don't hold them down in the water. The fact that they come back out of the water is to symbolize that like Christ came out of the grave, with this new resurrection, eternal life, so also they, when they place their faith in Jesus Christ, Amen. have been given new life. Amen. And they live eternally in Christ. So, the reality is, if uh, somebody has gotten baptized and never really placed their faith in Jesus Christ, then they just went for a swim albeit a short swim. Tonight, we want to remember the fact that Jesus says, when you place your faith in me, he says, you need to confess me before men. That's what our passage is getting at here. Verse 32, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. New believers are commanded to be baptized in order to give that picture, to to display that picture in baptism to a washing world, to you and me here tonight. Christ commanded them to do this, to tell you of what Christ has done for them. So they're simply acting in obedience to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're confessing him before men. What does that mean? What does it mean to Confess Christ. To confess Christ is essentially to identify yourself with him. It is to own him as your own. It is to declare allegiance to Christ. That's what it means to confess him before men. Much like when a man and a woman declare their love for one another in a public ceremony called a wedding, so also the new believer must declare his love and his allegiance, his union, his ownership of Christ in this ceremony. And Jesus here gives a promise and a warning for us. The promise, again, is in verse 32. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. The promise is if we will have Christ in this world, he will have us in the world to come. Now, Jesus here isn't teaching that the way we get to heaven is by telling everyone that we confess Jesus. It's not what he's saying. 
He's saying that those who have already repented of their sins and placed their faith in Christ alone for their salvation, those that have already done that, those Christians will prove their genuine conversion by confessing him before men. He's describing the kind of people that he will own in heaven, that he will confess before the Father in heaven. He, he, he confesses those who confess him. He does not confess them because they confess him. But these are the kinds of people that he does confess. Those who have placed their faith in Christ alone for their salvation, trusted him that he bore the wrath of God in, in their place, and then confesses him, owns him publicly, those are the kind of people who are genuine Christians, genuine followers of Christ. Those genuine Christians, what's amazing are those who Jesus will confess before the Father in heaven. We'll talk about that in a moment. But next, uh, there's a warning. Just as there's a promise, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. There's also a warning that if you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So, if the promise is true, the warning is true. What's the warning? If we will not have Christ in this world, then he will not have us in the next. That's the warning. If you don't want him here and now, then he will not have you then. What does it mean to confess Jesus before men? The word confess literally means to say the same thing. To say the same thing, to agree with someone. Now Jesus has been talking with his disciples about what they should be saying to the unbelieving world. Matthew 10, 27. I tell you, what I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the mountaintops. And then a little further up in Matthew 10, verse 7, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what Jesus is saying here is, you need to agree with what I've been saying. You need, you've been hearing the gospel that I've been preaching. You need to agree with that and repeat that gospel to the watching world, to the lost world. And he's been warning them as well that if they proclaim the gospel, if they agree with Christ, proclaim the gospel that he proclaimed, they will be hated by the world. Matthew 10, 22, same chapter. He says, you will be hated by all because of my name. So Jesus tells them, you need to confess me. You need to own me before men. You need to preach the gospel to a dying world. And when you do, they're not going to like you. In fact, many will hate you. Because the gospel is offensive. It disarms man of pride. The gospel says that you are dead in your transgressions and sins. That you are heading towards an eternity of eternal punishment and hell. If you do not go to this one way, Jesus Christ. That is quite offensive to our, quote-unquote, tolerant society. It just is. And many Christians are hated because of this gospel message. But Jesus knows that knows our timidity, knows our fear of men, and he tells the disciples and us three times in this, in this context, in, in, in Matthew 10, 26, and 28, and 31, he tells them three times, do not fear. Do not fear. You see, if you, if you say you're a Christian, 
but your words and your life do not agree with Scripture, then when you stand before God on the day of judgment, and you say, I'm a Christian, I know Jesus, Jesus, the warning here is, Jesus will not agree with you. He will not confess you. He will not say the same thing as you. Rather, he will say, as he says in Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, I want to emphasize something that, that, that is truly wonderful about the promise. So we've heard the promise and the warning But back to the promise, just briefly, if you would bear with me. Uh, Verse 32, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Let me introduce this thought with a question. Which is more shocking? That a lowly and helpless sinner would own the Lord Jesus Christ, or... That Jesus, the eternal, sinless, beautiful, powerful, wonderful, wise, and lovely, and, and glorious word of all, would own you and I. Which is more shocking? It's the second, isn't it? You see, for us to own Jesus publicly, to declare allegiance, and to live and speak according to his word. For us to own him, to confess him, there's no risk for us, you see, really. There's no risk for you and I. There's no settling, we're not settling for less, you see. We're not settling for second best. There's no compromise in this confession of ours. There's no loss. There's no shame. There's no regret if you own Christ today. Indeed, the reality is that we benefit eternally and are raised up to a place of privilege and we gain everything when we take Christ to ourselves. But for Christ to own sinners like you and I, dear friends, For Christ to own us, to have us. Oh, what a a stooping there was. What a humbling and, and a condescension that he had to suffer in order to have you and I. And think of this. That he would speak your name. Christian, speaking to you, think of the wonder that he would confess you before the Father in heaven, that your name would come up, that he would identify himself with you in heaven. That your name would be spoken by with the lips of our precious Savior in the presence of God the Father is unspeakable. It is an unspeakable honor. And how sweet it is that our Savior would say, that one is mine. I love him. I love her. I own him. I own her. They're mine, Father. How glorious it is that Christ would utter my name in the courts of heaven and yours where there is no trace or or, or speck of sin that your name, you vile, wretched sinner, that my name, with all of my failures, Oh, if you knew who I really was, you wouldn't like me very much. If you knew the wickedness of my sin, 
you wouldn't be impressed. That my name would be spoken in a place where there is no sin. I would think that this very uttering of my name would stain the walls of heaven. But because Christ died for me and washed me, He can speak my name and confess my name before the Father in heaven and say, that one is mine. Welcome him in. Have him as you have me, Father. Christian, listen. He is not ashamed of you, Christian. Don't be ashamed of him then. That's the point. You see? That's where it gets personal. He's not ashamed of you in heaven, Christian. Why would you be ashamed of him? In this world. Don't be ashamed of him when you're with your friends and your family, your fellow students, your co workers. He owns you. Own him. Tonight, we have some who are answering Christ's command, answering his call to own him publicly before men. And they're going to tell us about how Christ has saved them. Let me pray, and then we'll, we'll transition into our time of baptism. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross in our place. And thank you that it is, it is just as simple as placing our trust in Christ alone. That our sins can be wiped away clean. And thank you that uh, for those of us that are Christians, that are true believers, thank you. Lord, that you would speak our name before the Father. What an honor that is. May we not uh, treat that as a trite thing, but may that motivate us to own you, Lord Jesus, uh, in our lives, day to day, wherever we are. And Lord, I pray for these that are being baptized now that they would do just that, that they would confess you before men, uh, use their words to impact our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we have uh, three baptisms tonight, and uh, they're going to come up one at a time, and uh, they're going to give their testimony here. They have some, something written for you that they would like for you to hear from them. They've spent much time on that, so I would ask that you give them your attention, and then we'll baptize them uh, one by one, okay? First up is Jesse Calderon. Welcome him up. All right. Tell the people what the Lord has done in your life. Um, is this on? Yes. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse Calderon. And before I start, I just want to say I'm thankful for everyone coming out and supporting me and the other people getting baptized. It means a lot to me. Uh, before I came to God, I lived in great sin and felt so alone. I was in a very dark place in my life. I felt like I had nobody to go to to help me with all my problems I was going through. I was running from God even though I grew up in a Christian household and had, met, and had many people in my family and life who believed in God. I was living in sin day by day and had no guilt for it. I loved my sin and didn't want to stop doing the things I wanted to do. I only cared about myself and what was best for me. Going through all my selfish ways, I felt alone and empty. I lived for the world and worldly things. I felt like I had no purpose in life and no one to go to. I had so, many hate, I had so much hate and anger in my heart and didn't even realize it. I didn't even love myself at one point in my life. James 1.26, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. For so long I heard about God but never opened the door to acknowledge him. I only cared or care about him. i rather have the door closed and try to deal with all my problems by myself. I let it eat me up inside and got further from God. It wasn't until a long time before I opened the door and went to Christ. I started thinking about death and where I would go. It wasn't something that would it was something that would keep me up at night. I knew about heaven so I started praying every night to get closer to God and would ask him to save me before it was too late. 
but it wasn't until my sister's birthday party that I asked my uncle about God. Towards the end of the night, when everyone left, I was talking to my uncle about the differences between Christianity and Catholics and came across, and came across the question on how to be saved. That night was so eye-opening to me because I thought I had to do good deeds and to be perfect to come to God and be saved. My uncle told me a verse from the Bible, Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It wasn't until that night that I realized I was trying so hard for so long to save myself when the truth is I can't. I'm nothing without God and that the only person that can change me is him. I heard someone explain to me like this that gave me a better understanding. You don't need to be clean before you get in the shower. You get in the shower to be clean, just like coming to God. A lot of people don't want to come to God because they feel so dirty in their, in their heart and far away from him, but I came to him as I was, and he changed me and cleansed my heart. You don't have to be perfect to come to God. You go to him to, to be changed and cleaned by him and him alone. So later that night, I prayed to God, asking him to change my heart and for him to guide me to walk with him and to live for him and telling the Lord that I truly believe that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on, on the cross in my place so that I could be forgiven for all my sins and live an eternal life with him in heaven. The next Sunday at church, I was so excited to worship and hear the Lord. I had so many questions in my head during the message and my, pa and my pastor answered all of them seconds after. As I sat down in the chair, in my chair after the message, I felt a feeling in my heart I never experienced before. I had trouble swallowing and my throat became dry. I knew right there that God was talking to me and really felt in my heart he, God was with me. I went home and told my grandma everything. When I started telling her, I broke down crying. And it wasn't normal crying. It was, it was tears of joy. <laughs> And happiness because I knew the Holy Spirit was with me, with me and that he saved me. Amen. Being a Christian isn't easy. James 1, 2. Count all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces faithfulness. And let faithfulness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I've had to give up things that broke me down and filled me with anxiety, overthinking, and sin. I deal with situations that I feel like I can't deal with. But no situation is great. No situation or problem you're dealing with is greater than God. Amen. He's greater than all of them. No matter what's going on in my life, I just give it all to him. And he guides me the rest of the way. Even on my worst... Even on my worst days when I feel like I'm failing him and feel worthless. He changed me into a man I thought I would never be. I now live a changed and completely different life. I'm not perfect and still fall into sin, sometimes even my old ways. But I have the one and only perfect God by my side that has unconditional love for me and everyone in this room. No matter how far or close you are to him, he will always be there waiting for you. It's never too late to give your life to him. The best thing I ever done was realize that it only takes one night to give it all to God, my Savior. Wow, what a transformation. Amen? Amen. The trophy of grace, Jesse. Because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Mario Jimenez. Tell the people what the Lord has done for you, brother. Hey, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Mario Jimenez. Uh, I've been attending Redeemer since about 2009, uh, since the, what, sunrise days. Um, I was raised in the church. My mom uh, would take my brother and me to church faithfully uh, ever since I was a child and obviously him as well. So I grew up hearing about God. Uh, around my teenage years, I began getting involved with the youth, youth ministry, and eventually I made uh, what I thought was a serious profession of faith. Um, however, my response uh, was, was that of Matthew 13, 22, uh, where the seed was sown among the thorns. And eventually, the worry of the world choked out the word in my life, and I became unfruitful. My life soon became like Isaiah 29, 13. Um, I, too, was honoring God with my lips, but my heart was so far from him. I was more concerned with pleasing man than pleasing God. Like in First Thessalonians 2.4, uh, this way of thinking led to me essentially becoming a modern-day Pharisee. I thought that if I could keep up a Christian appearance and serve within the church, uh, that it'd allow me to do whatever I pleased in the shadows. It started small with lust and lying, but eventually... Because of my refusal to kill sin through the power of the Holy Spirit, those sins grew and grew. I was like whitewashed tombs. I was more concerned about my outward appearance than the condition of my heart, as we see in Matthew 23, 25, and 28. This act went on for, I put years, but let's be real, it went on for over a decade. It went on for a long time. I fooled a lot of people. Um, I didn't put this in here, but I fooled a lot of you. Uh, and I do ask for your forgiveness. Um, I fooled a lot of people in my pursuit to blend in and be accepted. I was content with living my depraved life outside of church. I was diving headfirst into sexual immorality, drunkenness, deceitfulness, and self-idolatry. I thirsted after doing what made me feel good as opposed to obeying what God commanded. Amen. After all those years of faking it and willfully choosing sin, I had reached a scary place of being numb to my sin. I had no problem with living in my sin because I preferred to serve myself instead of Christ. During all those years, I had not only sinned against a holy God, I had sinned against my wife. In my depravity, I had reached a point where I didn't care anymore. I was willing to destroy all relationships so I could live how I wanted. I was confronted by our pastor and my wife, and I told them to their faces that I didn't believe in God, and I wanted my sin. After this proclamation, I secluded myself and dove even deeper into my sins. I thought I knew what was best for me. I did never think twice about God. In my mind, I could finally do what I wanted. I thank God that this period only lasted a few weeks. 
God was moving in the background, using the prayer, prayers of multiple saints here. And my mom. <laughs> um, I reached a point where the sins I desired were no longer satisfying. I started feeling an uneasiness about where I was and what I was doing. Uh, and one day, my dad called me to see how I was doing. And I was still trying to keep up the walls, not wanting to change. Uh, but in the midst of the conversation, he made one statement. He said one thing. He said, come home. I miss you. And this comment instantly broke me. My, my mind rushed to Christ and his pleas to come to him. I was immediately overwhelmed with a sense of terror. My sins towards this holy God became so real. I knew at that moment that I deserved God's wrath and judgment. I remembered verses like Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Colossians 3, 5 and 6, on account of these things, sins, God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. I no longer desired my sins, but I didn't think I could be accepted by Christ. I still thought I had to do something to earn my favor back. I had done so much damage to my wife and even my own consciousness that I wasn't sure if I, had, if I could be redeemed. I reached out to Aaron for help, and after multiple meetings with him and earnest prayer and the reading of scripture, the Lord made it very clear to me that his mercy and grace are not dependent on me or my actions. All I'm called to do is repent and believe. We can see that in Romans 10, 9, and 10, Ephesians 1, 13, Acts 16, 30, and 31. One night I cried out to the Lord in repentance. I asked him for, to forgive me of my sins and believed that he is faithful and righteous to forgive me, as we see in 1 John 1, 9. I no longer worried about what others thought about me. I only cared about what Christ saw in me. I was finally at peace. I want to be in communion with God. I desire to be in his word, not because I feel like that's what others want from me, but because I know that's what pleases God. I no longer want my past life, but I want to follow God's commandments. I understood that God was my source of hope. And Yahweh is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed, it says in Deuteronomy 31.8. I love to run to Psalm 40, where it says, I hope earnestly for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a high rock. Amen. He established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in Yahweh. How blessed is the man who has made Yahweh his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who stray in falsehood. Many, O oh Yahweh, my God, are the wondrous deeds you have done. And your thoughts towards us, there is, none to, there is none to compare with you. I would declare and speak of them, but they are too numerous to recount. The Lord has been gracious to me. He's changed my wants and my desires. He's also been at work helping to restore the relationship with my wife and my friends and family, and, and you. I will forever have a posture of thanksgiving towards our Lord for what he has done in my life. 
Um, and yeah, I just I think that made me think of Ephesians 5:20, but that's that's it. Thank you, Mark. Wow, what a, what a work of God, right? God could have just said, I never knew you, right? But he didn't. He stopped you in your tracks. Praise the Lord for that. I'll take those <laughs> Mario, because you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. to make it through this. Isaac Vega. <laughs> Can't even say his name. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> tell him what the, tell the people what the Lord has done for you. Okay. Uh, my name is Isaac Vega and I'm going to share how God graciously saved me. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I grew up in the church and knew all the right and wrong answers. I used to aimlessly wander in my thoughts and completely zone out during the sermons and lessons. I always use the excuse of, <laughs> I need to use the bathroom to escape from the sermons. The only reason why I wanted to go to church was because I got to be with friends and family. <laughs> Whenever somebody asked me if I was saved, I told them I was. But the only reason I said it was because I knew that's what they wanted to hear. And I wanted people to know how much of a good kid I was. Even though my heart really wasn't. <laughs> I was continuously convicted of my sin, but I never wanted to repent and give my life to Christ. <laughs> my actions and thoughts never changed. I was still a selfish, prideful, hate hateful towards my parents, toward God and my parents, and empty because I didn't have a direction in life. 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 5 reads, For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, malicious gossips, without self-control, without gentleness, without love for good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers of peace rather than lovers of God. <laughs> Holding to a <laughs> form of godliness, but having denied its powers. Keep away from such men as these. The only thing I wanted to do was to play video games and to be with my friends. In 2019, me and my family moved to San Jose. I was stubborn and bitter towards my parents and God that I had to move away from the things I loved. And I, had no, and I knew nobody here. I was living two completely different lives in the church and at home. I was always bitter towards my parents, whether it was with school, chores, or even going to church. I felt like I never had a purpose in life, and especially living here. Everything all, had to be all about me and what I wanted. It was during the middle of COVID where God opened my eyes. On the day I, I was saved, I remember that I was arguing with my mom almost right when I woke up. And after the argument, we talked to each other. I told my mom I was sorry, but in my heart, I was still rebuking her and hating what she was teaching me. It wasn't until later I talked to my dad what had happened earlier that day. He told me I was being super prideful and arrogant toward them lately. And he told me that if I was truly saved, these past sins wouldn't be reoccurring every day. Romans 6, 1 through 3. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I felt empty without God. I knew something needed to change. I was a sinner in need of a Savior. 
So that night, I asked God to save me. I wanted to give my life to Christ because I knew he would fill my satisfactions and needs according to his will. Philippians 4.19, and my God will, will fulfill all your needs according to his riches and in, um, riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Ever since then, I can see that many of my past sins are behind me and that Christ washed away my sins. Even though I do constantly sin, I know that God fully paid it all on the cross. I am a new man who's now more humble. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I was respectful to my parents most, I'm still, I mean, I'm respectful to my parents most of the time. <laughs> Ephesians 1, I mean, Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. I also have a lovingness towards Christ and have a fire for wanting to learn more about him that's growing day after day. Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I also have a fullness of joy and satisfaction in knowing Christ. I now know that God put me and my family here for a reason. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for peace and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. I, I now do all things for the glory of God alone. Praise the Lord, he would save me. A wretched, prideful, sinful, hateful, undeserving person that only cared about self. I can now call him Abba Father. In conclusion, if you aren't saved, Christ can save you no matter what you've done or even what you're going through currently. Just fall on your knees and turn to him. I strongly exhort you. Turn away from your past life because life with God is far superior than an empty life with no direction and reason to live. Thank you. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, he, the Lord can take a lover of self and transform him into a lover of God. Amen. Wow, what power. Isaac, because you place your faith in Christ alone for your salvation, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I got to preach. How am I going to do that? <laughs> I want to end our time tonight, friends, bringing our minds back to Jesus' conversation with his disciples that we were looking at earlier. And if you recall, Jesus gave a promise and a warning. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus was commanding his followers to go into the world with a message. It's the message that you heard tonight. The world was going to reject them and their message, but Christ was encouraging them to go anyways. What's that message? We've heard it a few times already tonight. We've, we've kind of seen the message play out in someone's life. But I want to give you some clarity uh, to, know, to understand exactly what is this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, 7, preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Mark 1, 15, he told them, 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You've heard and seen what that looks like in the lives of these three sinners. Three times you've heard that we are all rebellious sinners before a a holy and and, and a pure God. You've heard that God in His justice should judge us in His wrath. That God is has graciously sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be judged in our place on the cross. You've heard that God forgives sinners and changes them into saints. They have confessed Christ before men. What are you going to do with this information? What what are you going to do with the gospel? Remember, dear friend, you are a rebel against your maker. You cannot and you will not know him and love him the way you ought to. It's impossible. And even your good deeds... Even your religiosity and being a nice person will always fall short. It will always fail at the task of earning the favor and the smile of God. But God in His mercy sent Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, into this world. So that Christ, when, when He came into this world, that's what we celebrate on Christmas, right? When He came into this world, He lived a perfect life. He lived the life that you could never live. He always and only knew God, loved God, and obeyed God as He should. He did what you cannot. And at the end of his life, he wasn't rewarded with with thanks and adoration of his people. He was crucified. He was murdered on a cross. As he was rejected there on the cross by his own people, the reality is that Jesus was absorbing, taking upon himself, you could say drinking in that eternal judgment that you and I deserve. So the amazing reality is on that cross, the eternity of hell that you and I should experience because of our rebellion, Christ drank in an eternity of hell. On the cross. So that not one drop of that wrath would be left for you. What do you do with that? That's the question. What are you going to do tonight? Well, Christ tells us himself. Repent and believe in the gospel. To repent is simply a change of mind. Now, we change our minds all the time, don't we? You know, I want to have Taco Bell. I change my mind, I'll have McDonald's instead. That's not quite what he's talking about. It's a complete shifting of your uh, allegiance. It's a complete uh, a changing uh, of of how you view everything, how you view life, how you view God, how you view yourself. It's a turning of your mind and heart, turning away from sin, away from rebellion, away from self, and turning to God. It's not an act. It's not a work. 
And we know from Scripture that even that is something that God grants you anyways. But nonetheless, he commands you to do this. Turn from exalting and loving self. Turn to exalting and loving God. This turning of the mind and heart does not remain in the mind and heart, though, because it will show up in a different life, different words, different actions. It's called the fruit of repentance. Not only must you repent, you must believe in the gospel. And in a sense, these are one in the same action, in a sense. You, you are, you are uh, turning from trusting in self to, turning in tr- to trusting in God. You're turning away from trying to earn God's favor on your own and be a good person and, and, and earn heaven. Turning from that self-allegiance and self-dependence and turning to God in full dependence upon Christ to get you there. You see, when you turn from self to God, you are turning from trusting in your own efforts to earn your own way into heaven, and you're turning towards Christ in faith and trust. Let me say it one more time. All mankind are sinners in rebellion against their creator, God. All of us deserve God's eternal judgment and punishment. But God in his grace sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life of obedience in our place, and then to die a sinner's death in our place, receiving the judgment and punishment that should go to us. And then he rose from the grave and conquered over death in our place as well. And if you place your faith in what Christ has done for you in your place, God promises to forgive you and receive you into heaven for all eternity. That's what you must believe. And I say you must believe. You must believe the gospel. You must believe this good news. I'm not saying you must repeat it. I'm not saying that you must just know it. I'm not saying that all you need to make sure is that you don't disagree with this message. That's not good enough. The fact that you, that you don't reject or disagree with what I just said is not enough. You have to personally cast your soul upon Christ. You have to trust Him with your eternity. You have to bank all upon Him. It's a personal trust that you individually will be saved from the wrath of God that is to come by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. As I close, John Stott, pastor, preacher, once summarized the difference between Uh, The religions of the world versus Christianity. Because you might be saying, well, that's a nice message. I appreciate that. That's really neat. Thank you, Pastor. But then you go and live your own life or, you know, you're, you're you're open to other religions. And, well, this is just one way to God. John Stott would disagree. The Bible disagrees with that. John Stott gives an illustration to kind of drive this reality home. He says, think of a sinner like a drowning man in the middle of an eternally wide and infinitely deep ocean. He's drowning and floundering, helplessly, unable to swim. And then these religions and the leaders of their religions come by. Confucius comes by in a boat and Confucius calls out to you, to the sinner that's drowning, you know, you should learn from this experience. 
He goes on his way. Muhammad comes later on. And his, he says, all you need to do is just stop swimming and resign to the will of Allah. He goes on his way. Hinduism, followers of Hinduism come and says, don't worry, you'll be reincarnated. Try better next time. The New Age gurus next float by in their boat and they say, there is no sea. There is no ocean. You're not really drowning. Buddha comes by and cries out, struggle, try your best, and be as, be as noble as you can be as you drown. And if I may say, the Pope comes by of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, I'm stepping on toes. <laughs> and he says, Here's a life preserver. Try and swim your way to shore. And as he tosses you the life preserver of good works, you find out that it's filled with lead. And as you grasp for your good works, it only drives you faster to the bottom of the ocean. But Christ comes by, walking on the water. What does he say to the drowning sinner? He says, take my hand. Take my hand. I will save you. Oh, sinner, dear friend, turn from your life of sin that is drowning you. And reach out with the hand of faith. Take hold of Christ even tonight as your Lord and Savior. And Christian, if he has saved you, then confess him before men. Stand with me as we pray. We're going to sing one more song. Heavenly Father. Well, what a glorious gospel we have. It's, it's almost too easy. It's almost, uh, we, we think that well, surely there must be something for me to do. Oh, but you tell us, no, no, no. I've done it all. You need to just trust me. Lord, you will not share your glory with another. You will not give us anything to boast about, to brag about. To say, well, we figured it out. Or we were good enough. No, all credit, all glory must go to you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for this night. Help us now to celebrate and to sing and to fellowship together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing.